Ladies and gentlemen, this session is the future of women in the post-pandemic workplace. Please welcome Jeanette Abraham, founder, president, and chief executive officer of JMA Global LLC. Joy Harris, president and chief operating officer at DTE Gas. Nancy Tellum, executive chair of Echo and co-founder and chief executive officer of Fast Blue. And to moderate the discussion, Rhonda Walker, anchor at WDIV TV for NBC. Good to see everyone. Thank you for joining us for this discussion. We have a powerful panel here. I can't wait to get into the conversation. And of course, first we want to talk about that women in the workplace post pandemic. Uh, a lot changed. 170,000 women left the workforce during the pandemic. So the landscape has changed. Mm -hmm. I think, Joy, I want to start with you uh, at DTE. What changes happened during that time the last couple of years? Yeah, so um, obviously, you know, we're an energy provider, right? So we continue to serve our customers throughout the pandemic, but we had to figure out how to do this in the safest way possible for our employees and then for those that they served. So um, obviously, much like everyone else in the country, those that could work from home did. And our frontline employees, they were continuing to show up every day and commit to the services that we needed to provide to our community. But I can tell you that uh, since that time, we're, we're reestablishing what normal means for our company. And we have a hybrid work environment. Again, our frontline employees are still coming to work every day and still going out in the field. But our, our office employees are spending less time in the office and they still have that flexibility. But we're trying to be very thoughtful in how we bring them back and making sure there's a purpose for us to be in the office and that our employees appreciate that. Um, we did not see a mass exodus of our employees from the workplace. Mm. As and that's result. interesting because yeah. you have a lot of face-to-face -face in people's home contact, which that's is the correct. one thing that you were avoiding during the pandemic. That's right, and, and we had no choice. And so we had to equip them with the right PPE so that they could go inside. We had to educate our customers around how to distance themselves from our employees as they perform their work. And then we had to you know, pivot when the situation called for it. So it, it was a challenging circumstance, but I'm happy to say I uh, am very proud of the work that our company did, not only for our frontline workers and for our customers, but also for the community in general. Um, women at DTE, the, the balance of that, frontline workers and in the office, uh, when I think of DTE and people out working on the line, I typically see more men than women. What's the diversity there? Yeah, so I would say on average, uh, we have fewer diverse um, employees in the field. In the office, it's, it's no different than this geography. I think it's, it's 25 to 35% mm -hmm. are women. Um, but what we're doing, though, is encouraging particularly young women to get involved in the skilled trades. Uh, we've got the Tree Trim Academy. Uh, in the city of Detroit, where we're encouraging women to be a part of that Tree Term Academy. It's a readiness program so that they can enter the skilled trades. Uh, we are also engaging with um, students, it's a place where I'm really passionate about, you know, <laughs> STEM in general, and making sure that we reach those kids early and, and expose them to the sciences so that they can get interested, much less prepared for you know, taking on STEM careers when they become available. So I, I'm like stomping for STEM uh -huh. <laughs> all over the Detroit area. How are you doing that? Are you you're in yeah. the schools? You have programs? Yeah, you we have them? programs. Uh, we are participating in FIRST Robotics. Uh, we support organizations like DAPSEP, Detroit Area Free College Engineering Program. Uh, we have girls in STEM, so we're trying to our best to expose young girls early to STEM education and just get them interested in experimenting, mm -hmm. and then making sure that they uh, get the enrichment that they need so that they can pursue STEM in college. Nancy, I want to bring you in to talk about your perspective as it relates to this new environment that we're in post-pandemic, and, and women particularly in the workplace. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, I think during 
the pandemic, I think it had the biggest impact on women. Um, uh, there was a requirement of being at home and it all fell on women's shoulders. Now the question is, is how do you bring them back again? And it's, and I've, what I've seen, um, there are a lot of women who either are, during that period of time, started re, really reevaluating what they want to do. And it, it's a, there's a silver lining to, to that period of time where you really had the opportunity to reevaluate if it was really the job you wanted to. Uh, be in whether you wanted to work more at home since that was also a, a possibility. So I, I actually think that um, this is really kind of one of the most exciting times right now because the way in which people are working have changed due to technology. Um, depending on your skill set, you can really, really um, design the kind of job that you want. And for others, I think there's a greater opportunity and, and certainly what we're trying to do at Boss Blue is really present and, and offer up programming um, people who can inspire others and give guidance to those who are looking for a new path. So talk about Boss Blue for those that aren't familiar um, with this new space, this new club, if you will, specifically for women in Detroit. First of all, Rhonda, I don't like to call it a club. Um, I want to highlight the point that, that it's really uh, the door is open. There are no requirements other than to pay a, a membership fee, um, and it's a nonprofit. So the whole idea of it was really to create itself a, a safe and welcoming space for women. Uh, we've been really very intentional in making sure that the community of Boss Blue is very diverse and inclusive. And along with the kind of everyday opportunity to come, you can work, you can exercise, you can meet others. There are at night, there's, thank goodness, we have a, uh, a liquor license that makes a whole big difference. <laughs> um, we're looking at the space right now here yes. on the screen. Um, but it, even in the afternoons after work, people come and, uh, and have a drink and listen to jazz and just give an opportunity for people to really connect with one another. But most importantly, with respect to our programming, um, it's really an opportunity for people to feel that they can grow their educational seminars and um, really an opportunity f really to discuss the harder issues that a lot of, that we should be discussing. Mm -hmm. I mean, throughout this whole week, we've talked about bridging the gap, being authentic, mm -hmm. showing empathy. And honestly, those are the these key um, qualities that, that are really part of Boss Blue. And also just this ability to be able to connect maybe that CEO level with someone who's just in the front door of, exactly. of arriving in a company and actually being able to interact where that interaction would be almost impossible. Correct. I mean, we have at this point, which is surprising, over 650 members. And when you sign up, <laughs> yeah, and when you sign up, you're, as, as you mentioned, they're CEOs, they're people who are just, or women that are just starting out in the business, or trying to figure out, entrepreneurs are trying to figure out a, a, their direction. And um, what's great about it, we have a mentor matching and a member matching program. So literally half of the women who signed up raised their hand to be mentors. Mm. The other half, surprisingly, raised their hand to be, ment uh, to be the mentees. So we have these programs that we can connect people with, with each other, which again, whether it's in Detroit or any other city, it's really hard to do. 600 members in less than a year. Yeah. Shows the need there. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> it's really exciting. Um, I'm, I'm sure, Jeanette, you would have loved to have a, a society of women in your predominantly <laughs> male industry of automotive. Um, you've obviously been impacted having a manufacturing facility with the pandemic, with the supply chain issues. I mean, everything that we've had an issue with is, has hit you. Mm -hmm. Talk about that perspective as you lead. Well, it's been rather crazy, as <laughs> anyone might suggest. I am a warehouser. I am a just-in-time warehouser at my company for all goods and services that are required for the OEM. And I'm responsible for the quality. I'm responsible for maintaining the inventory, which brings you into the issues that were in our face with this pandemic. I buy a lot of product offshore, and my container costs went from 5000 to 25000 mm take it or leave it. Mm. And my customers are saying, take it. 
And so when you run a business, you really have to be aware of your finances, the needs, what needs to happen. Um, and you have to rise to the occasion and figure it out. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, no matter what kind of business you have, you have to figure it out. It's new. We had never been in a pandemic before. On March the 24th of 2020, um, Gretchen says, shut it down. And we shut it down because everybody had to shut it down because we were in the midst of something that we didn't know how to handle. But at the same time, my customers are saying, no, you can't shut it down. I need my product. And so until everybody shut it down, um, we actually were away from March the 24th to May the 26th. Now you can imagine that is two months of losing revenue, still having to pay the rent, paying your employees, deciding for a few weeks maybe you should go on unemployment, getting a PPP loan, all of these nuances that said, regardless of the situation, you have to make it feel and look invisible. And I'm really proud of the fact that we did it. I have an employee staff of less than 10 people. And many of my employees have been with me from the beginning of this journey. The company was founded in 2001. And the good news is that I didn't lose anybody. Nobody got sick from COVID. But I had to start developing those sensitivities and empathy, as my cohorts here have discussed, uh, where you have to find inside of you, if it were you, how would you feel? Mm. Have we lost anybody in our families? Mm. You know, what has happened to you that impact your ability to just keep it moving? And so I had to listen, uh, be focused, and pay attention. And, and be autonomous in people's needs. I could only let one person work from home, but only for a short time. You have people in your company that doesn't even want to get a COVID shot. And, and so you have to be concerned about your employees. So this hat, this big hat that most CEOs have to wear, um, felt heavy at times. But through your employees, a lot of people will tell you that employees are our biggest asset. We're only able to do what we do because there are people who do what they're supposed to do to make the company look really good. So you have to have a listening ear. You have to talk to your customers, and you better have a relationship with them. Everybody needs to understand what it is you're going through and what it is you're trying to do collectively to make this situation get better and hopefully eventually go away. Now, who could have imagined that after all this time, we're still struggling. Yeah. We're still okay. struggling. You know, first it was an anomaly. Like, this happened when, 100 years ago? Who would have imagined that in our lifetime, that something like this could occur? And so the good news is that we shift. You know, when you're a leader, whether you're a CEO or not, you shift. You shift and rise to the circumstances, and then you try to problem solve. And you better not try to do it by yourself. Because that empathy that we all keep talking about is a collective of what you do for your next steps. It makes people comfortable. It makes them understand that you care. And it makes you feel like you're not in this all alone. And so being in the automobile industry, you know, I, I started when I was 16 years old as a high school co-op student. And so I have been in automotive for more than 50 years. And... It's amazing when I look at myself. I was like, girl, really? 50 years? <laughs> that does deserve an applause. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. But, but honestly, I live it and I breathe it and I teach it. Um, there are so many things that we learn about whatever our journey is in life that you kind of forget. You don't dismiss them, but they're always there. And when emergencies rise, it just rolls forward. And you have an opportunity to use your best practices in your toolkit to achieve the things that you thought were never possible. So we made it. We were able to come back to work. I, I lost some revenue, but to be honest with you, it was one of my best years. Mm. And I didn't have to suffer. My business grew um, during that time, which was quite an anomaly. But 
It's all those relationships. When people believe that you can do what they need for you to do when they need it, they'll call on you. And it's up to us to make sure that we maintain a level of consistency that supports that feeling. Mm -hmm. Because you don't have a good relationship, it's hard. It's hard to prove your point. You must so have you it. touched on your long, over 50 yeah. year career. Yeah. Um, you have been able to get your foot in the door uh, in an industry that many people would like to be in mm -hmm. uh, as a, a minority owned and female owned tier one automotive mm -hmm. supplier. Um, talk us through how you were able to navigate that and, and get into kind of that, that old boys network. Yeah, definitely it was. Yeah. Um, if you guys can imagine, I, I know I'm telling on myself, but I think I look good for my age, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but um, thank you. I started at GM when I was a 16-year-old co-op student. And I was a senior in high school, and I worked my senior year there. And just through showing up, being consistent, you know, listening to my parents who didn't have nearly the opportunities that were presented to me, I was able to take those nine buses a day, if you will. I mean, I really did. That's not an exaggeration. Um, to get to this job and to get back home so that I could be in this learning curve and learn as much as I could. So after I graduated from high school, of course, I wanted to go to college, but nobody in my family had been to college. I would be the first. And so I had a really good HR guy that says, I want you to stay. I want you to take this position. I'm going to talk to you like you were my daughter. Now, I didn't understand that that meant relationship at that time, but it truly did because profoundly he said, well, look at it like this. All your other friends who are going away to college, they're probably going to have student loans and you won't have any. <laughs> We're gonna pay for your whole education. Now my sacrifice was to go at night. It wasn't a horrible sacrifice. I was still achieving some goals to make me a better person. And so I never had another job in my life. I've never been unemployed. I, I worked for GM for 32 years. So at age 48, somebody said, I've been watching you. Back to relationships, right? I've been watching you, and I really feel like I'd like to have you partner with me in a manufacturing business. And, and leave GM, and your leave safe GM. place after 32 years. And I was like, I get paid every 15th and last day of the month. What are you talking about? You know, like, it was such a risk. But it's really my faith in God that really allowed me the courage to take a step because there's way more in our lives that we're able to do if we give ourselves a chance. We're fearful, but knock fear down. Don't let it control you. I left for a $30 million job to be the majority owner, and we grew the company to $50 million. It was during my tenure there, which I did for eight years, that I founded my own distribution company. Because I looked at the balance sheet, which my mentor taught me, and I said, wow, I pay a million and a half annually for somebody to do this for me? That's a good startup business, right? Yeah. And so you have to believe that you can, and you have to have good mentors and create good relationships. The favor that I was able to achieve in this male, white male dominant environment uh, was one that people began to appreciate your ability when you are consistent. Demonstrate who you are. There is no point in your life that you can't do this, whether you're my age or if you're my child's age. You know, it just doesn't matter. And so, Rhonda, that's really how um, it happened for me. You know, people would say, oh my gosh, she takes nine buses a day. You know, it just demonstrates your ability to do and to be. And regardless of all the things that happened along the way, um, even in, I was sharing with someone today, you'd sit in a meeting and you'd have this great idea. Sometimes you'd be afraid to say it because you don't want to sound stupid. How many people can relate mm -hmm. to that? Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, somebody says what you were thinking, you go, dang, I could have said that, right? <laughs> and, 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 the, and the interesting part is, is that you can't be afraid to say it because it is a learning opportunity. And, and the second part of it is, is that it generates a lot of conversation for you to continue to grow and learn. So I was like this, 
you know, 16 year old, turned 17 and graduated. And, you know, I finally got my first car and I was driving to Warren to the tech center at work. And, um, and it just evolved over time. I continued to go to school. You just have to keep on pressing, no matter what the situation looks like. Because you have to understand that it may not be for the situation that you're in. It may be for the situation that's ahead of you mm -hmm. that you're not even focused on yet. And being aware that people are watching you all, all along time. that journey, yeah, too. I want to bring in Joy because yeah. uh, you had a long career at I DTE. Yeah. Talk about where it started and the, your pathways and your advice sure. in order to get to president and CEO of the company. Sure. So my relationship with Mishcon actually then started at age 15, very similar. Mm -hmm. I shadowed uh, engineers at our company when I was 15 years old. And I came back uh, when I went to college as a co-op. And I've been there ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I often say I came here from the womb almost. <laughs> But um, when I arrived, um, I actually started in the field. I worked as a technician for many years before going into leadership. And you, my, my career has spanned every part of the gas organization. I ran a compressor station. I ran you know, system operations um, before moving into higher levels of leadership. But what I can say is you talked about having mentors. Mm -hmm. You also need sponsors. Mm -hmm. And there is a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, sponsors, folks that are going to make that pathway, create that opportunity for you because they see you mm -hmm. in action. And I oftentimes coach uh, other women leaders that, you know, you need mentors, mm -hmm. but you also need sponsors. Mm -hmm. And those are the folks that are going to open doors for you and give you very crisp feedback because they see you in mm -hmm. action, because they have witnessed your work. And seek out both. Don't just anchor yourself to a mentor because he or she may only you know, react to what you tell them. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't necessarily have full context. So I have been blessed to have very just wonderful mentors and sponsors across my career. And I've tried to do the same for others. Um, DTE is a very large company, 10,000 employees. We have operations across the country. And uh, what I often coach folks on is, you know, figure out where you want to grow and learn. Match up what you're great at with where the great biggest challenges are. Mm -hmm. uh, find the greatness in you and, the, and look for organizational challenges that match up with your capabilities and then apply yourself. Seek them out. Ask for those opportunities. I think you're saying seek them out is yes. the important word yes. there. But let's Ask. talk about those that don't. I'm sure you've experienced that in, in your careers. What happens? What's, what's the consequence of, of, of that? Of not asking, yeah. I of, think not, it, of not seeking out these of relationships. Of not seeking, seeking it out. I think what happens aware. is you rob yourself of the opportunity. Absolutely. And exactly right. if you don't, um, I, I, for me, yeah. I say, be the architect of your own career. Mm -hmm. um, it is incumbent upon you, as much as everyone else that's trying to help you along the way, to chart your own path and pull people in to help you uh, achieve what it is you're attempting to do. And if you don't, and if you aren't engaging others, then you're missing out mm -hmm. on that opportunity. Yeah. And Nancy, a lot of times you hear women say, but I can't get my foot in the door. They won't listen yeah. to me. I can't. Well, look, I experienced the same thing. I, I uh, was a lawyer for, God knows, six years and hated every minute of it. And I really wanted to get into, <laughs> um, I wanted to get into entertainment. And it really took me a good full two years because uh, breaking in was really, really hard. And it was one of these things where I would go uh, and just say, I'm not looking for a job. I just want to know what you're doing. Just make those contacts. And it really took a really long, I mean, look, entertainment is not brain surgery by any means, but somehow it was so tough to jump in. And, and, and I was relentless to talk to everyone when there was a job, trying to convince someone said I was overqualified, some I wasn't qualified. I, it was really hard. And thankfully, um, to your point, there was one person who actually believed in me and said, I'll give you a shot. Mm -hmm. once, once you're in it, mm -hmm. and I think the point that you made about 
designing or controlling your destiny or designing is a really tough uh, uh, decision, I think, for a lot of women. Yeah. I think when you get into the job, you're focused on doing the best you can. You're focused on really having, doing, you know, it's far less about, and you don't actually believe that you can actually control it. It's by someone that anoints you as opposed to saying, look, this is the job I want. This is what I'm going after. And I think when I started in entertainment, clearly this was not, you, you couldn't have that directive. There were way too many men. There weren't any women in it. And every step was really, to your point, by having someone who would be your sponsor to say, look, I'll give you a shot. Um, now I think, thankfully, there are so many more women in the, the workplace, and I do think, and while there's men available to help, I think there's a really strong bond between women that really um, are here to support each other. Mm -hmm. and, and frankly, as I'll, I'll, and that's kind of, one of also one of the inspirations of Boss Blue, of just having a, a, a sense of a network of women who you feel comfortable you can reach out for guidance and, and for support. So, and any of you can answer this when we talk about this network of women and, and reaching higher levels, that, that C-suite, or being on the corporate boards. Are you seeing change and shift, more diversity, more opportunity? I, I myself, I think that in, in my business, I was one of the first presidents of an entertainment company, and, and it wasn't because, and it was really breaking at that point. There still aren't that many, there aren't any actually, except for Sherry Redstone, uh, CEOs of media companies. So we have a long way to go. And within the, the ranks of entertainment, you have a lot of women. And you know, when I built my team, it was primarily all women and it was the greatest group <laughs> that I went from Warner Brothers to, to <laughs> CBS and they all followed and yeah. we, we were, we were we, we had a great amount of fun. It was like family. Mm -hmm. But I think that as now, and I think in all companies, whether it's uh, you know corporations or boards, um, all of this requires intentionality. Um, and I think there's great more intention on the part of the leaders that there has to be more women, has to be more women of color. Uh, and people of color filling these ranks. Mm -hmm. Same thing with boards. I mean, I, I'm on several boards, and at this point, you know, and being involved in the uh, uh, search committees, we're being very intentional about it, which I think is great. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a long way to go, and, uh, you know, there's recent, some recent um, court case that essentially tried to kind of eliminate the, the corporation's responsibility actually to filled the board chairs with, with uh, uh, more underrepresented people. But I think, you know, as this has kind of been the theme of the week, I, I think the companies have their own values. They have their own principles, and they, they really have to adhere to them in order to make sure you have the right people working in your company, as well as those that are working on the board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Nancy said it though, it starts with the commitment at the top. Mm -hmm. It will not happen unless that commitment exists and there is an intentionality in making that happen. And I'm seeing more interest. Um, there's still a long way to go. Um, I think that as um, women ascend into some of these top leadership roles, mm -hmm. I think that even more <laughs> progress will be made. Right. Um, and in particular, um, I'm interested in seeing more African-American women city, city, sitting on boards. We are seeing uh, some interest in certain sectors um, in industry, but not all. Mm -hmm. And there is an opportunity, and we have a lot. As African-American women, we have a different perspective. We have different experiences, and they are valued and certainly can offer great value to companies on boards. I'm a guest. Please. <laughs> I am an observer, um, and I have consciously been very aware of that intention at DTE. Um, talk about the diversity within the company and at very high levels. Yeah. I, I think that uh, once you make the commitment, you got to measure it. Yep. You got to make sure that you are actually instrumenting the commitment. And if you see you're not making progress, that calls for action. 
Uh, and um, I'm happy to say that I'm a part of those discussions and we are measuring our progress and we are seeing opportunities. We are looking for those broken rungs mm -hmm. on our ladders and um, we certainly aren't where we aspire to be at the end, but I am just proud to say that we are at least starting the process mm -hmm. and certainly activating where we see the opportunity. And the intention is there. The intention is there and it's genuine. Mm -hmm. um, I say this often, I can work anywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I can work anywhere, I, I guarantee you. I choose to work it mm -hmm. because and I feel comfortable there. Obviously, we watch that DEI intention grow because Absolutely. of horrible things that have happened in our country. But was this intention there prior to that at DTE? Yeah, it was. Uh, and I think it intensified mm -hmm. afterwards. And um, we're accelerating activity as a result because I think our, our community certainly had an awakening. Our employees had an awakening. Our customers had an awakening. This entire country yeah. had a similar awakening. And I think it gave everyone reason to pause and reevaluate. Mm -hmm. The automotive industry. Um, you are an anomaly in your position, mm -hmm. um, having an automotive supply company. Black women aren't really in that space. You're one of the only. Yeah. It's been interesting because. Still. It still is interesting, but you can't work in an environment for as long as I have and not be skilled at it. You, you can't not know who your competition is, what it is you need to do to maintain some even balance of being in the club, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be able to participate with some knowledge and gain respect of people, and so, even though I traveled um, as a black woman alone, I had a white mentor, uh, uh, an Irishman who loved the city of Detroit and really sponsored me, if you will, to take the next step. And back to people noticing you is because people pay attention to you. So regardless of how it sometimes make you feel, you have to still keep making positive steps because the bottom line is that if you can't love on yourself to make sure that you can compete and participate in the game, you can't expect somebody to work harder for you than you do for yourself. But the guidance that you get, um, expressing your desires to your sponsor, you can't make them do all the work. Oh, like, here Jeanette comes again. What do you want now? Have an idea of what you want. You can't ask people to mentor you if you don't have an idea you know, because they're busy people too, and you sought them out because of something about them, their leadership skills, you know, they're, they're quick-witted, able to manage the situation, managing things in crisis. Women, um, even when I worked in my early days at GM, couldn't get into certain jobs because they said we were too temperamental. Really? <laughs> I mean, and so, <laughs> this is a battle, you can get to that, right? Even in your industry. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and so you have to still fight the good fight regardless of how it looks. And so it is hard um, because there weren't any, you know, girls clubs that you can say, oh, girlfriend, you could do this. Just, you know, <laughs> go ahead. Go back in there and say or do this. And so I did prevail, but many didn't. You know, they didn't get the opportunities um, that I got, and they didn't have a chance. But I'm saying, and that's still happening today. It's still happening, yeah, and, and I'm saying that, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it still happens. But I think the challenge that we need to issue is that, you know, we need to encourage more sponsors. For sure. We need to encourage more allyship. Mm -hmm. um, and I think calling it out and um, being very deliberate in asking uh, companies to really show up in a different way, I think will go a long way in changing that dynamic. And, and there's another aspect of it too, is like what companies do to hire and, mm -hmm. and the recruiting side of it. That's because true. I don't feel you know, that, that there is a pressure. You hear it from the corporations, like we'd like to find a person of color to fill this position. Mm -hmm. There is a... They, they, I don't think they go deep enough, mm -hmm. frankly. It's like you, you see the same people in the recycled world of these are the names that are approved, so to speak. And I think from a recruiting, as long as we keep relying on recruiting agencies to, to help us fill these positions, 
they need to do a better job of yeah. going deeper into the, mm -hmm. the pool and finding, because they're amazing, mm -hmm. uh, and being even more intentional from their standpoint of going deeper into the employee pool to find some really stellar people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I knew time was going to fly when I knew who my panel was going to be. <laughs> we are out of time, but let's hear it once again for Nancy Tellum, Joy Harris, and Jeanette Abraham. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.